And welcome everybody to the Dan Bedani Show right here on TruthRadioShow.com. So we're doing a biblical series, and today we're going to do the book of Matthew, chapter 6. So what we're doing is, what we're going to do actually, is going to go by chapter by chapter. And if you missed chapters 1 through 5, they are in the playlist here. We also did the book of Jude, which is only one chapter. So uh, what we're doing here is doing a comprehensive study of the Bible. We're not going to sit here and skim through it. And if you just want to hear somebody read the Bible, heck, there's... Um, so many channels out there that have audio Bibles. That's not what we're doing. We're going to go a deep, comprehensive study of the Bible. So basically this chapter, chapter 6 here, it has many uh, verses. I mean, like we got uh, 34 verses, which is not not quite a lot. But uh, basically you could read through 34 verses in probably like maybe a minute or two. Depends how fast you read. But that's not what we're doing. We're doing a comprehensive study. So what we do is we um, uh, read in this context. Let the scripture interpret scripture, and let the Holy Spirit, our comforter, teach us. And um, so we pray to you, Heavenly Father, and first of all, Jesus, Yeshua, please forgive us for our sins and transgressions, and make us right before you, Lord, and we ask you to bring the comforter to us, and he who is in us is greater than all the world, and bring that comforter, the Holy Spirit, to us to help us understand, to teach me in us, and also everybody here watching as well, your word and help us to understand in full context of your word and your messages in the book of Matthew chapter 6 today. So we ask in your name, amen. So we're going to do here, guys, it's going to go right to the scriptures. And so this is, um, it's going to take a while, guys. So uh, because this is a lot of context in this chapter and a lot of people uh, need to understand the context is key, you know. So anyway, um, chapter 6 begins and I uh, strongly encourage people to open your Bibles for yourselves. Or open up uh, an online Bible. Uh, we use the King James. We use the Geneva. Anything newer than the King James, we avoid. So the New King James and up, we do not use uh, the King James and uh, below. Basically, King James and older. So anyway, so uh, take heed that ye do not do your alms before men and to see, be seen of men. And otherwise, you have no reward from your Father which is in heaven. So what is this talking about? Doing good works. Doing good deeds. So therefore, when you do these alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, in the streets that you may be have glory for men. And verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So um, I'm sure everybody's seen this if you're on social media. I'm sure you all seen this, okay? Uh, you'll see some rich rapper or somebody, anybody, you know. They'll take video. They do this all the time. They'll take video. They'll go up to a homeless person, give them a brand new pair of sneakers, uh, clothes, money, and um, yeah, you know, and uh, they do this all the time and on video, you know, which is great. Nobody's saying it's not good. That's not what the Bible's saying. But the thing is, if you're doing this, okay, for rewards for men or to be glorified by mankind to make yourself look good, yeah, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And uh, when mankind, like, oh, that's such a great thing, you put a thumbs up, oh, that's awesome of you doing that. But you've got your reward. That's your reward. You're not going to get a spiritual reward. You know what I mean? And this explains it. In general, you know, this is Jesus himself saying this. But when you do these alms, let the left hand know that the right hand does. So do what your left and your right hand doesn't know. Plain and simple. I'm sorry, let the, not the left hand know. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, so when you do these alms, let the left hand not know what the right hand is doing. So I, I'm sorry, guys. I, I goofed that up. So, yeah. Uh, plain and simple. Let your... Don't, you know, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. What that means is, in other words, give it and forget about it. You know what I mean? Don't dwell on it, whatever the case. Give it, walk away, forget about it. You know, that's what it means. So that thy alms might be in secret, and thy father, which will see in secret himself, shall reward openly. So again, it says, give what your left, your right hand, I'm sorry, and your left hand doesn't know it. And you, your alms may be in secret, and the father which sees in secret will reward you openly. So if you, get, if you actually get in the context, it says, do these things in secret, and you'll get your reward from God, you know what I mean? He will reward you openly. But if you don't do these things in secret, you don't like, oh, look at me, everybody. Yeah, 
you got your reward. You know what I mean? Like, you, yeah, you, you got glorified by men. It reminds me of the people at the churches, too, right? Um, when they had passed the donation plates around, you always got that one person that sits always in the front somewhere, you know, front, well, second or third row. Then he's got a short right? Instead of just putting the money in the basket, you know, humbly. Nope, they got to fan out that $100 bill or $50 bill. Look, oh, the 20, look it, and hold it out like that. And, you know, drop it in place so everybody sees that he's donating 20, 50 bucks, whatever the case. You know what I mean? So that person that's only got a dollar or two and putting it in a plate, they're like, ooh, you know what I mean? It makes them feel insufficient. Which technically is like, you know what I mean? If that's all you got, you're giving more than the person with the 20 bucks. You know what I mean? There's a parable for that too uh, when Jesus talks about it. But um, yeah, so give in secret. You know what I mean? Give in secret and you know do what your right hand and your left hand doesn't know about it. Plain and simple. And when, uh, chapter, uh, verse 5, I'm sorry. And when you pray, pray not, don't, I'm sorry, don't be uh, like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. But verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So if you get what this is saying, okay, don't be like those people. Oh, look at me, I'm praying. Uh, you know, like just, you know, you have to let no, everybody know you're praying. You know what I mean? That's not what you do. You pray in secret. And this goes against a lot of religions, so, because religions love to do, you know, everything out in the open, praying, in, you know, so you're glorified by mankind. No, that's not what the Father wants. You know what I mean? I love the book of Matthew because it's just like a nuclear bomb to all religions. It really is. Because the, the faith here, we follow God. We follow Jesus. And our teacher is Jesus. Our teacher is the Holy Spirit, not mankind. You know what I mean? And I stay away from all religions. I don't belong to no religion at all. I, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, plain and simple. You know what I mean? And again, we use the King James. And uh, sorry if I botched a couple of verses up. Uh, you know, you, people say, well, you can use the New King James and you can use the newer Bibles. It's easier to read. Yes, absolutely it's easier to read. But what you don't know is they take a lot of keywords out of these newer Bibles and they change words or remove them all together or add something to it. You know, in, in Revelation says, don't do that. You know what I mean? You're going to be uh, <laughs> cursed big time for the people who remove things, edit it, or take them out. Uh, uh, add them, I'm sorry. So that's why we like to stick with the King James and older might be a little tough to read, but you know what? We'll get to it. You know what I mean? That's the way I see it. So once again, when you pray, uh, enter in your closet. This is verse 6 now. When you pray, and now again, I'll go back to 5. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, stand in the synagogues, and in the corners of the streets, so they may be seen of men. And verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So people are like, oh, look at them. They're praying and all that stuff. That's pretty cool. You got your reward. But if you want a reward from the Father, I rather, you know, I, you know, when I pray and all that, I don't, I, of course, I pray on a show, but when I pray, normally I like to pray in secret because the Father says to do that. You know what I mean? The, 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 and I say yeah. So, but when you um, pray, enter into the closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which will see in secret shall reward thee openly. So, you know, I mean, if you have a closet, whatever, or your bedroom, plain and simple. Go into your room, shut your door, or a private space you got, like an office, whatever, it doesn't matter. Go into a private place. Shut the door and pray in secret. Pray to the Father in secret so nobody hears you. And the Father, which will see this in secret, will reward you openly. I'd rather get rewards from the Father than of men. You know what I mean? Plain and simple. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for much of their speaking. So this goes a long way. Uh, we could go a long way with this now, um, this one verse here. So praying vain repetitions, what is that? Well, I, you know, Half my life, well, quarter of my life now, uh, uh, until I was a late teenager, I was a Catholic, right? And we prayed the rosary, which is vain repetition praying. Yeah, you pray ten times each, you know, the prayer, ten times each ro uh, bead you up. And uh, so uh, you go to confession, the priest will say, go say ten Hail Marys, uh, five Our Fathers, whatever. That's vain and repetition prayer. Number one, you're not supposed to pray to Mary in the first place. Only through Jesus only. That's it. He's the only mediator between man and God. And we're going to cover that in this book. 
So I love Matthew again because it just destroys religious narratives. It destroys the religious lenses. So when you read the scripture for yourself, you're seeing the full context of that. So again, don't use vain repetition prayer. Because you're not going to be heard. And the thing is, a lot of people think, oh, if I pray 100 times, right, I'm going to be heard first before anybody else. Or I'm going to be heard right away. No, it doesn't work that way. It goes a very long way. So you pray once. So you don't have to keep asking him and begging him. You know what I mean? Ask him. He already knows what you need. But ask him. And, you know, you're, you ask him 50,000 times is not going to get it any faster. Just like your parents, right? <laughs> yes, you have your father 15 times. Oh, if you, you can go to the mall with your friends, but you're grounded. No, 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 no. Every time you ask, no, and your, your punishment is probably going to get worse. That's just one example, whatever the case. But this is saying, don't use vain and repetition prayer. It means nothing to God. You know what I mean? You know, you're not glorifying God. Because the heathen do this. And what does the Bible say? Have no ways of the heathen. Don't follow the ways of the heathen. Now, the rosary, a lot of people don't, you know, they're, you know, they're going to get choked up when I say this. The rosary prayer is actually a pagan tradition. It's a pagan ritual. And also, when you uh, use vain repetition things, it's good because of incantations. So if anybody's been involved with the occult, like witchcraft, whatever, they use things called incantations. So they will say something over and over and over and over again. When, you know, whatever the, the spell is, they'll keep reciting it and reciting it. That's incantations. It turns from something into an incantation. So could this turn into an incantation? Absolutely, I believe so. That's why uh, Jesus is very blunt. Don't use the vain repetition prayers. Because in the occultic world, they take stuff that might sound good too and turns into an incantation. So it could go a long way, you know what I mean? But either way, the occult used vain repetition, their version of praying, which is casting spells, but they'll do it over and over again, over again, thinking it's going to you know, become more powerful. You know what I mean? And in the occult, sometimes it does. You know what I mean? But Jesus says don't do that. Plain and simple. You don't need to pray a thousand Hail Marys. You shouldn't be doing a Hail Mary in the first place. But you do pray, pray to our Father. You know what I mean? And you only have to do it once. So be therefore... I'm, by, I'm sorry, be not ye therefore like unto them. Your father knows what you things you need before you ask him. So I just, you know, that's what I just said. So don't use vain and repetition prayers as a heathen do, for they think they're going to be heard <laughs> for their much speaking. But be not therefore unto them. Don't be like them, that's what it's saying. For your father already knows what you need before you ask him. So what's the point of using vain and repetition prayer? He already knows what you need. You, you don't have to ask him 15 times. It's like your mom, right? Uh, another example. That's what. This is why Jesus used parables. This is why. So people could not possibly misunderstand him. And I. this is what I like to do myself. Because uh, parables are um, layman's terms, whatever the case they call them today. So this is the same thing. Like, just say your mother knows you need shoes if you're a kid, right? Go to school, right? Your mother knows you need a new pair of shoes for school. She knows that, right? So you think asking your mom 15 times is going to get the shoes any faster? No. Probably going to tick her off, but whatever. She already knows you need those shoes. You know, it's just another example, you know what I mean? You know, we could go with so many examples, but for the sake of time, yeah. So after this man, I therefore pray. Pray this prayer right here. And you don't need to do ten at our fathers like the, the priest would have you do. No, you don't do that. And first of all, you don't even confess your sins to a priest in the first place. Jesus is the only mediator between man and God. You don't need no priests or anything like that. So, after this manner, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So that is the quote the Lord's Prayer. I think it's uh, in the book of Luke. I think it's a little bit different. A couple words are different. But that's uh, generally the Lord's Prayer. So and, and here's the thing, too, in the occultic world. Um, you know, because we, 
on our spiritual warfare shows, we expose the occult. We expose secret societies and everything else, our spiritual warfare Friday shows. So uh, we do a vast study into the occult and all that, and I don't recommend anybody doing that. Um, I used to be in the occult like a dummy years ago, uh, but I did learn a lot about the occult on an education basis so I could expose them, you know what I mean? So what they'll do is they'll use those incantations, rep rep repetition prayer. They'll also, and if you notice, um, there is an old occultic uh, slogan called, As Above, So Below. That's a perversion of this prayer. As right there, as earth is it is in heaven, as above, so below. But that's uh, again, it's a perversion of the occult. So if you heard as above, so below, uh, that's a perversion of this prayer, and everything in the occult is nothing but perversions of what the Bible says, and uh, and most of it's all sexual, so it's disgusting. So. Yeah, so this is a beautiful prayer, it really is. And uh, I like to say often, I don't say often enough as I should, but yeah. And, then, you know, in one day, you know I mean, you don't, again, you don't you have to say 10 of them in a row. You're not going to be heard any more than you say them once, you know. So we just said it, you know what I mean, in the prayer here. So, you know what I mean, that's what it means, you know what I mean. So I like to say it frequently, like uh, every other day or whatever, if I remember, but I, I got to pick up on my prayers. You know I mean, you can't pray enough, you know what I mean. And again, it's not using repetition prayer if you pray all the time, no. Because you're just talking to the Father. And so there's a million things to talk to him about. And I pray to him, uh, sometimes I pray to him like dozens of times a day, but it's not about the same thing. I'll sit there and talk to him, uh, <laughs> have a conversation with him in a car or something. And uh, if something's on my mind, like uh, the Sethite theory or something, in the, you know, these religions try to distort the Bible, if I'll sit there and have a full-blown conversation with him. I'm like, what's wrong with these people? You know what I mean? And he gives me knowledge and everything else. So that's what that means. You know what I mean? So, so again, you know what I mean? Like that, that's an awesome prayer. And uh, so, and if you forgive men, this is very important now, guys, right? Verse 14. There's so many lessons in this one chapter. So amazing. So we already learned about repetition prayer, and we already learned about alms. You know, doing good things and giving and all that. And now we just learned about prayers. So now we're learning about trespasses and forgiving people. So here's the thing, right? Uh, for if you forgive men the trespasses, your father will also forgive you, right? But if you forgive not men of the trespasses, neither your father will forgive you. And moreover, when you... Well, I'll get to that in a minute, but this is a lesson here. So we, this is uh, very powerful here, and I understand there's a lot of people out there who's gone through trauma. Now, I learned this the hard way, okay? And uh, so, with, you know, I, I learned this hard way, and I know there's a lot of, I'm too, trying to come up with words because without uh, getting somebody upset, okay? Because um, they'll just be straight up. Uh, so... There's a lot of people out there who've been through trauma, like rape, um, things like that, right, in that nature, or been abused, or whatever the case, okay, and, uh, you know, I, that's between you and God, you know what I mean, and that person, so, uh, what God's asking you to do, right, forgive them, I know it's hard, it's easier said than done, it could be anything, you know, rape, or uh, just somebody smacking you, stealing from you, whatever, and you're really angry at them, right, and over the years, I've uh, grown resentment toward the people. Grown resentment toward the people that did me wrong, ruined my life and all that stuff. And uh, well, there was a lot of hatred and resentment building up in my heart, you know what I mean? So um, I went through a test, a tribulation, you know, and, you know, I was down on my luck. I was like living in my car at one point and uh, lost my family and all the stuff going into it, right? And, um, and I'm like... I knew it was a test going on. Something was going on, and uh, the Lord was trying to teach me something. So, and then just like everybody that wronged me for some reason, not just in that point of time, but all the way back far as I can remember. You know, back to when I was younger, uh, one of my stepfather's friends tried to molest me and all that stuff, and uh, all that stuff, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, and uh, then uh, I'm like, why am I, why, why is this coming up to me? Then the father spoke to me, and he said, Dennis, verse, because these verses came to me. It's like, if you don't forgive these people, I'm not going to forgive you, you know? 
So it was weird, right? And um, awesomely weird. So I started going through the lists. You know what I mean? Everybody that's wrong me. Everybody. And the people at the time, too, at the time I wanted, oh, I hate. Uh, it was like almost a hatred because they really destroyed my life at the time, you know? So I'm like, I started praying and I started forgiving this one, forgiving this one. And then as I'm going on, I feel this weight lifting off my chest. I felt better. I'm like, how can I feel better for forgiving these people that just wronged me? But I felt better. And I was like, wow. Then as I'm catching up to the current situation in time, when I forgave, I forgave them. I honestly forgave them. And I still do, absolutely. And wow, it was like a breath of fresh air. And I understand, ladies, or whoever out there has been through some bad stuff, all right? That doesn't mean you have to like these people. It doesn't mean you have to hang out with these people or ever talk to them again. But you forgive them, okay? And I know it's easier said than done, trust me, all right? Forgive them, and you'll feel this massive weight off your chest like you would not believe. Then when, um, yeah, I honestly forgave everybody, right? And I felt this, like, you know, you take this uh, big breath of fresh air, like, you know what I mean? And it feels so good, or you're massively thirsty, you're down some Gatorade, ice cold Gatorade or something, you're like, ah, this relief uh, uh, feeling across your chest, you know what I mean? It was like that, you know what I mean? The, the euphoria. And right from then, um, literally the next day, things started getting better. Better and better and better. And uh, I got back tenfold than when I lost. And it was a massive test that God was putting me through, and I couldn't understand what the test was about. Then I figured it out, you know what I mean? Then God helped me go through this test, and for a reason, because I had so much hate and ang anguish and all you know, that built up toward people over the years, you know what I mean? And the Lord straightened me out, you know what I mean? He put me through a test and trial, and he does these things for a reason. So again, uh, if you forgive men of their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But people say, well, yeah, I thought Jesus forgives you for anything. Yeah. But he's not going to forgive you if you don't forgive someone else. And here's the thing, too. Ask you, put yourself in this situation, right? That guy stole from me. Why the hell should I forgive him? All right. All right. That person, uh, you know, sucker punched me. Why should I forgive him? That person sliced my attire. Why should I forgive him? That girl cheated on me. Why should I forgive her? All right. Keep that in your mind, right? Why should you forgive them, right? And this is the, the trials I thought of this too, right? Think of all the stuff you did over your lifetime, right? The stuff you did, the spiritual, physical, you know, adultery or whatever, you know, like uh, just all, all the bad stuff you've done, right? So you're saying, why should I forgive those people, right? Turn this around. Why should Jesus forgive you then? Well, I didn't molest people. I didn't, uh, you know, cheat on them. It doesn't matter. You, what you do in your life? You stole something one time, right? You swore. Some people curse God, you know what I mean? And uh, you've done bad stuff in your life. And if you say you have it, you're a liar. Plain and simple. Either in your mind or really did it, right? So, so the same could be said about you, right? Why should Jesus forgive you? Why? Then you look at, oh, yeah. Now you understand, okay? If Jesus could forgive you for your wretched stuff that you've done, and it doesn't matter what those people did to you. It doesn't matter. Jesus forgave murder, okay? He forgave criminals. The guy on the cross there, that acknowledge that this guy's a savior, you know? He goes, he, we deserve to be up there to talk to the other guy on the cross. We deserve to be here. He did nothing wrong. And he told, turned to Jesus says, Jesus, could you please remember me when you enter your father's kingdom? What do you tell him? Oh, oh yeah, you, you did all this, I'm not going to forgive you. Nope, he told him, from this day forward, you'll be with me in paradise. That's also in the book of Matthew, yeah. So ask yourself now, it's like, is it really, I mean, yeah, you probably went through some trauma, some bad stuff, yeah. But is it really that hard just to forgive them? Again, you don't have to go like them. You don't have to hang out with them or even see them again. Forgive them. Because if Jesus could forgive you for the things you've done, spiritually or physically, yeah. And people say, well, I never did anything bad, but have you had premarital sex? 
have you did this or that? You know what I mean? Or uh, what's left to somebody? It's not even sex stuff too. Or have you stole something? Have you broken any of the Ten Commandments? Yeah. So if Jesus can forgive you, you can easily forgive them. Get the point? So again, if, uh, if you forgive men of their trespasses, that sins against you and everything, right? Your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive them of their trespasses, your Father's not going to forgive you. Plain and simple. Moving on, he has verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, be not like the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to the men to fast. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. But though when you fast, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that you appear not unto men to fast, but unto the Father, which is a secret, and the Father shall see you in secret and reward you openly. So this is another lesson here. This is such an amazing chapter right here. Let's, let's look at this for a minute, right? When you fast, and if you don't know what fasting is, it's usually uh, it's a spiritual thing and a physical thing as well. It's like uh, I'm going to go a couple of days without eating food. Some people fast just drinking water. And some people just don't eat or drink for X number of days. And it's good for you because it does regenerate your body. You know what I mean? It does. It's amazing. It eats out, well, out some fat cells and everything else. And, but it is, and it's a spiritual thing. It's showing obedience, it's showing dedication to the Lord, you know what I mean? So when you fast, right, and fasting is normally a spiritual thing, okay? It's saying, Jesus is saying, don't don't show it, you know what I mean? Because if you're fasting for a long period of time, you get disfigured a little, you know, it, your face is a little uh, white or whatever, it, whatever the case, or your mouth's dry or something like that, uh, you know what I mean? And you purposely do this to show everybody I'm fasting, hey, I'm fasting, you know what I mean? You already got your reward. But again, when you fast, right, anoint thy head and wash the face. Anoint the head means like, uh, you know, if you got some dryness with it, put some oil on it, like olive oil or something that would, uh, or a chapstick, whatever too, you know, uh, that shows you're not uh, thirsty, whatever the case. I mean, you know, in other words, wash the face too. But get rid of the signs that you're fasting. That's what it's saying. Disguise it. This way nobody knows you're fasting. Right? So you don't appear to men that you're fasting, but unto the Father which is in secret, and the Father will see it in secret and reward you openly. So this is just amazing stuff. This is another lesson here. Many lessons in this chapter. So one more time, when you fast, right, don't tell people you're fasting. Don't let your face get disfigured or whatever. Any appearances at all that you might be fasting, don't do it. Cover it up, whatever you have to do, to make sure people don't know you're fasting. All right? So when you do this, you please the Father because you do it in secret. And you will get your rewarded and openly. So moving on, chapter 9, I mean, uh, verse 19. Lay up your treasures upon the uh, yeah, I'm saying, yeah, lay not up your treasures upon the earth. Don't lay up your treasures upon the earth. That's what it's saying. Where moth and rust corrupt. And where these break in the steel, right? But lay up your treasures in heaven, where neither moth or rust does corrupt, or the thieves do not break in the steel. Because for where your treasure is, there also your heart will be. So this is another cool lesson, yeah. So again, uh, your treasures, I mean, with basically, uh, is, you know, we're not saying there's nothing wrong to have goods, okay? But don't dwell on them. Don't cover it after them. Don't, like, oh, I'm so possessed with this thing I have. You know what I mean? So, and if you look for treasures, like, anything you have, okay, anything, anything, your clothes on your back, they, somebody can steal them. One day the clothes I'm wearing, you're wearing, they're going to get beaten up by moths or whatever, rusted up, whatever the case, right? Uh, your car you have, somebody can steal it. Well, it's going to rust away. You know what I mean? Anything you have, everything, family heirlooms, everything, right? You get the point, right? Even your most prized possessions, right? One day it's going to get destroyed, one way or another, right? So if you look for treasures, guys, seek spiritual treasures. Where moth and rust doesn't corrupt and destroy it. Where nobody can steal it. 
Because if you're storing treasure up in heaven, nobody can steal that. That's yours for eternity. That's the beautiful part. Like my phone here, right? My iPhone or whatever I have, uh, my pocket knife, my guns, whatever the case. One day those are going to turn into rust or whatever. They could get stolen. Something could happen to them. Who knows? Or a corrupt government could come steal it all. You know what I mean? We, we don't know. So when how do you store up spiritual treasures? Is you do good, good, do good for the Lord in secret. Again, the alms, when it was mentioned in the alms, giving, helping people and help, you know, giving them food. It could be anything. You know what I mean? Food, food, clothes, or just helping them in general, giving them money, whatever. Do it in secret, and your treasures store up in heaven, where you'll never lose them, never. Every one of your earthly possessions are going to be lost, or stolen, or destroyed, one way or another. The house you live in, it's not going to be there forever. Sure, I could live through another generation, two generations, whatever, eventually. Yeah, you, you get the point, all right? So again, don't store your treasures up on the earth. Store them in heaven. Because for where your treasure is, there also you be hot, where your heart will be. So what does that mean? If you're worried about earthly things, this is what it means. If you're worried about earthly things, that's where your heart's going to be. If you're concerned about, your, in your, you want to store up heavenly treasures, right? That's where your heart is. Seek the kingdom of God. That's what it's saying. And again, it's not saying it's nothing, you know, people take things out of control, you know. It's not saying there's anything wrong with having a house and money, whatever the case and, you know, if you have money, you help other people, too. But there's nothing wrong with having these things. But don't put your heart into them. You know what I mean? We, you know, boys have in mind that anything, these things can be destroyed or stolen. Plain and simple. You know what I mean? And uh, when you do good things, you can store your treasures up in heaven. Those are the more important ones. Yeah, we work hard to pay for houses and whatnot. Yeah. But you work harder spiritually to pay for, you know, your treasures in heaven, you know? Because all the stuff you see here are going one day. All of it. So we'll go to verse 22. Hang on, guys. My mouse is acting crazy today. Verse 22. And hang on a second, guys. So the light of the body is the eye, and therefore thy eye be single, and the whole body shall be full of light. So, but if the eye be evil, thy body shall be full of darkness, and if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is the darkness? So what does that mean? The light of the body is the eye, and therefore, the eye shall be single. So this goes a long way. This is where uh, Satanists, um, that, you know, depends what level of Satanism, and uh, cultists take this out of context. They'll say he's talking about the third eye, the pineal gland and the occult. This is it. Yeah, he's finding the light in the eye. And called, you know, the third eye. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. In that sense there. So... What he's saying is, like, basically, if you seek in darkness, okay, your whole body's going to be full of darkness. And when you seek light, your body's going to be full of light. So if you're a person who's seeking good stuff, like when do the Lord, you know what I mean? The light, the illumination of God, you know what I mean? The knowledge of God. There's many meanings behind this stuff, yeah. Seek the knowledge of God through God, you know, the Holy Spirit. And do the light because uh, remember in the occult everything's backwards. Remember that in the occult they believe that they are the light and God is the darkness and God is evil, right? That's what they think. They think they are the divine, right? But this is the other way around. Yeah, this is Jesus saying no because Jesus always identifies as the light, right? The truth, the light, the way. So the light of the body is the eye, and therefore thy eye be single. Thy whole body shall be full of light. So, and if you're using that spiritual eye, they call it, again, the third eye. You know, it's the penile gland, whatever. And in the spirit world, okay, you're seeking the light of God through the Heavenly Father. And this happens to a lot of people, and I don't know if people get this through. Sometimes when you, um, 
you're really concentrating, like uh, not concentrating, but uh, talking to God and all spare whatever. Sometimes you get this little twitch over here. You know, it's like you feel something there. You know what I mean? And that's spiritual, okay? Because we see through that spiritually, not through like uh, you know physical eyes. So the single eye, you know what I mean? And uh, but again, the cult reversed that. You know, the all seeing eye crap on the back of the dollar bill and all that. That's the eye of Lucifer. That's a whole different thing. That's not what we're talking about. This is not what Jesus So Don't let any occultists misinterpret these Bible verses to fit their agenda because they'll use that, that uh, all seeing eye, the dirt eye, the penile gland, and all that. They'll say that, oh, Jesus talked about it. He found out the power of the, the dirt eye. Not in that sense. You know what I mean? So do not ever let these people convince you because, again, these uh, people in the high levels of the occult, now I'm not talking about those kids who just uh, kill cats in graveyards or something. I'm talking about high levels of people in the occult, right? They know the stuff. They know the Bible very well. But again, they they flip it. So be very, very careful with that, right? And understand that the only light that can ever come is through Jesus Christ. Any other light is evil, plain and simple. Any other light will bring you darkness. And that light is indeed be darkness, and how great is that darkness? Because it says, but uh, if thy eye be evil, right, the whole body shall be full of darkness. And if therefore the light is, the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So notice how it says the light uh, in thee be darkness. This is the false light they're talking about. This is what I'm getting off this, yeah. You know what I mean? Because uh, in the occult, this, I mean, again, uh, this is why we uh, should know, you know, our enemy, you know, I mean, in Ephesians 5, know your enemy and expose him. Because the enemy uses these two verses right here to, you know, so-called prove their version of the third eye. The peanut mm -hmm. one. And if you're using that third eye, guys, to um, bring that, you know, the false light in, you're opening your soul up to a, <laughs> a demonic floodgates. That's what you open it up. And then you're playing with hellfire, plain and simple. Any light you seek, you always to challenge it too. Make sure this is of God. Make sure it's of Jesus Christ. And if it does not say it's from Jesus Christ and prove it's from Jesus Christ, you have to rebuke it. Plain and simple. And uh, there was um, there was Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike and uh, Manly P. Hall also. Uh, his uh, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, where they talk about this light, this third eye, and everything else. And they say any 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 uh, knowledge from the light to take even of Lucifer. You know what I mean? And again, Lucifer's light, that's what means illuminated one, that's a false light. That's a light of darkness. So that's kind of what he's talking about. This is like, uh, we could go deep into spiritual warfare with these two verses alone. But seek Jesus only. He is the only true light, plain and simple. Verse 24 says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold the one to the one and despise the other, and ye cannot serve God and man. Another word for Satan. You know what I mean? Mom and Ra, mom and, you know what I mean? It's, uh, so anyway, yeah, you can't serve two masters. And... Again, yeah, people say, well, this goes so many different ways. This is when um, basically they, too, they accuse uh, Jesus, uh, which we go into the next chapter, I think it is, when they accuse Jesus of being of Satan. You know what I mean? When he says the divided kingdom can't stand, but you can't serve two masters. In other words, if you're going to church, right, or you're in a, uh, some kind of a Bible study club, right, but on the weekends, you're going to the satanic rock band or something, right? That's just pure Luciferian crap or whatever the case, right? Yeah, you got one or the other, all right? You, you can't serve two masters. And just by partaking in that stuff, that's evil, you know what I mean? So if you're going to, uh, all right, make a better example, right? Again, this is why Jesus talked to parables. Better example, right? If you're doing a Bible study with your family on the weekends, right? But Saturday night, you're sneaking off to, uh, yeah, your friend's house because they're doing, um, they're all getting together to do some witchcraft or whatever the case, right? Yeah, because you're trying to hang out with your friends and try to please your parents too, yeah. 
that's trying to serve two masters. You know what I mean? There's many examples of this. So, I mean, you, we've gone all day with this. But, you know, because you got to hate one. you, you got to love one. you got to hate the other. Or despise one or the other. You know what I mean? So, again, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And you can't serve God and man. So you can't serve God and Satan at the same time. That's what a uh, blunt would it saying. Verse 25 says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body uh, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and then the body uh, than raiment? In other words, like, uh, is your body not more important than meat and clothing? Take no thought of it, you know, for your life, uh, you know, what you're going to put on and all that. Because he says in, in verse 26, Behold the fowls of the air, that's the birds and all that. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into bonds, uh, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not much better than they? So this is what this is saying. The birds don't worry. That's saying worrying. That's what it is. Don't worry about what you're going to eat tomorrow. That's what it's saying. Don't worry about what you're going to uh, put on your body tomorrow. Your father knows what you need. And, it, it, and again, it's not to be, um, because people take these things to another level. They'll sit around, uh, I have a cousin, uh, yeah, so when he was younger, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's probably, a bad, I don't know if it's a good example or not, but anyway, he, he wanted to, you know, find a beautiful girl, get married and all that stuff. So he was the type of person that sat in the house all the time. I'm like, dude, you gotta go out and look for girls. Oh, God, God will hand me her, right? And I'm like, dude, you stay in the house all day doing nothing. The girl's not gonna come back at your door and say, hey, uh, uh, God sent me to date you and marry you. <laughs> you know what I mean? You gotta go out and do work too, you know what I mean, for these things and all that. You can't just sit there, you know what I mean? So, um, that don't, because you know, people take this to another level, you know what I mean? Hang on, guys. Let me fix my uh, computer here. My uh, mouse is uh, USB ports are loose. So therefore, yeah, uh, t don't take, don't worry about what you're gonna eat tomorrow. You know, and don't worry about what you're gonna drink and uh, what you're gonna put on your body and all that, because he says the birds, they don't worry about that stuff. You know what I mean? Because they know quietly, yeah, they know the Father's going to feed them. They're going to wake up tomorrow, they're going to have food. And he says, aren't you not better than them? Because, yeah, God made us, you know, as the superiors of this world. You know what I mean? In other words, uh, you know, we are over the, the animals. You know what I mean? He made them for us. You know what I mean? He made all creation for us. You know what I mean? So if you're much better than the birds, right? That's what the Father says you are. We are created in his image. The birds are not. So we're much greater than the birds. So if the birds are not worrying, why are you? I know it's easy said that now. We all worry, and I'd be a hypocrite if I said it. Didn't. But we, gotta, we all got to remember that because it's a society that puts that on us, you know? Like, oh, crap, the rent's going to be due tomorrow, and I'm, uh, yeah, I'm running low. You know, uh, we, we understand where that comes from. But, you know what I mean? But the Father will provide, you know what I mean? The Father always provides. Just have faith, that's all. And 27 says, uh, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to a statue? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say, you know, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like these, uh, one of these, the lilies. For God so clothed the grass of the field, which is... Uh, this today and it's to tomorrow is cast into the oven. Shall he not uh, much more clothe you, O little you one of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, whether shall we be clothed? For all these things the Gentiles seek, and for your heavenly Father knows what you need of all these things. So this is uh, all one here. Verse 25 through... 
Well, 32, that's one big lesson right there. So with, with that saying, again, hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat and drink or what you're going to wear. The breads don't worry, right? And you're much greater than the breads, right? Then he goes on to say the earth, the earth, the, he clothes the earth with grass. And again, take no thought for what you're going to eat, drink, and wear. For all these things, okay, all these things, do the Gentiles seek, right? Don't be like the Gentiles. Don't worry about it, you know what I mean? Because your Father, your Heavenly Father, knows that you need of these things. And he's saying, seek the first kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So if you put God first in your life, and it's not, that it's good, it's not saying you're going to be rich and all this stuff, things are going to be handed to you on a silver plot, you still got to work for these things, but God's going to give you the doorways to go through. Put God first, okay? Above your marriage, above your wife, above your children, above your parents. Put him first and foremost, right? Then he will provide the rest for you. And all these things will be added on to you. If you're putting a woman first, okay, that's wrong. You know what I mean? Or, you know, a woman out there putting a man first. No. Even our own children. I love my uh, child to death, but one person I love more than my child is Jesus. And Heavenly Father, you know what I mean? Holy Spirit. Put those things first. Then the rest will come upon you. And yeah, seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. And take therefore no thought of tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought of the things itself, sufficient unto the days of evil thereof. So it says don't worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow's got, it's got its own uh, worries. Don't worry about tomorrow. And this is such a great teaching, really. Is uh, yeah, don't take no thought for your life or what you want to eat, drink, and all that stuff, and what you're gonna wear. And because the birds, yeah, the birds don't worry about the stuff, but the father feeds them. And you're much better than the bread, right? And you don't take any thought uh, about uh, adding one cubit to his statues. For they take the thought of raiment and consider the lilies. This is uh, awesome, yeah. The lilies of the field, right? How they grow and they toil and they spin, right? And I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now this is uh this this is uh something uh, extraordinary. So Solomon in all his glory, what does that mean? His entire kingdom. You know how beautiful King Solomon's kingdom was? Yeah, one of the most beautiful kingdoms, right? That's what he's talking about. In all his glory. When the King Solomon before he turned bad and before God took his kingdom away, yeah. When he was, you know, serving the Lord, he had such a beautiful kingdom. All his glory, right? But the lily, how is a lily much greater than all of King Solomon's glory? How is that possible? A lily. Did you ever see one of these things in the uh, microscope? Go look it up on YouTube, man. It's crazy, right? And uh, we can see things on a molecular uh, level, right? That's how God sees things. To us, it's just a flower, right? It's white, whatever the case. It's flower, whatever the case, right? I think it's white. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, so, so it's a flower to us, right? We pick it up, uh, it's nice and smooth, whatever. So how could this be greater than the beautiful kingdom of Solomon? All his glory had beautiful buildings and all this stuff going on, right? How could that one flower, the lily, be more like, beautiful? Well, you should see it on the molecular scale, like when they put it under microscopes. Like, it is so amazing, like the, uh, the cells to it and everything. It is so beautiful. And when you look at things on a cellular level, man, uh, the human body, the, um, the atoms and all the, um, the genes and proteins and all that, it, it's amazing. Some of these things got piston engines. Like if you ever look at a piston vehicle, you see the pistons moving? It's a biological piston, like with the sperm, right? Uh, you know, the seed of man, the sperm. The sperm, it's, you know, the tail, is a, literally a piston engine. A biological one, of course, not all for gas, 
uh, and fuel like a car's used, but it's a biological piston engine that keeps that going. It's amazing when you see things the way God sees them. And this is why I use this Matrix stuff, guys. Not that I glorify the movie The Matrix, but it's what we're trying to do is we're trying to unlock your mind. Get your mind out of the real world. That's why I use this Matrix stuff. The back, the overlays and all that. Because you just get your mind out of the real world, okay? And into the things that you can't see. That was like one of the messages of the Matrix, though, you know what I mean? Don't be consumed by the world. There's more to it, you know what I mean? And, uh, and it, with the, you know, the, the world does is puts this um, fake illusion over you that you're limited to these certain limitations and all that is set by mankind. No. With God, all things are possible. And, uh, and that's why a lot of Christians say I can't comprehend some of this stuff, yeah. Because they got a worldly view of the Bible and they can't comprehend it. They think it's all figuratively. They don't believe in Jesus, but they think most of it's figuratively. When most of it's literally. You know what I mean? Because they can't comprehend it literally of it because of the illusion the world's put over them. And when you bust through the matrix, if you want to call it that, you know, you see things for what they are as God sees them. You know what I mean? And it's, uh, it's amazing when you look at the lilies and all that. And uh, just a lily in a microscope. Uh, it's, better, it's more beautiful than any city we have today. Like Tokyo, New York is all lit up at night. It's beautiful. Or Las Vegas, whatever. Yeah, more beautiful than that. Uh, it's uh, it's amazing. And wherefore God so clothed the grass of the field, which is the day, uh, which today is, and tomorrow cast into the oven, and shall not be much more clothed on you, O you of little faith. And therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or where we shall be clothed. You know what I mean? So, uh, and after all these things, uh, do the Gentiles seek, for your Heavenly Father knows that you have these things, you need these things. So remember that. He already knows these things. Don't be like the Gentiles, you know, worrying, yapping, oh man, you know, and people get to arguing. You know how I many relationships get destroyed, all this stuff? Oh man, you ain't, you know... You know, the the wife's get upset, the guys get upset because the rent's due coming or the insurance pay you know, is overdue. And then it starts arguments between the couple. Instead of them both saying, like, all right, let's calm down, God will provide. Keep faith, God will provide and he will. You know what I mean? And if he doesn't, there's a reason. There's a better door opening up after that. When one door closes, the better door opens up. He opens up better doors. You know what I mean? So... This, you know, worrying like the Gentiles there, right? Causes so many arguments that it leads to destruction. You can lose, people lost relationships off this stuff. Because, you look, ye of little faith. They had no faith. Well, again, seek first, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, all of the food, the clothes, the drink, the house, um, you know, car, whatever the case, all these things will be added on to you. Seek God first and the rest will fall in its place. Don't seek the other stuff first. Don't seek the worldly stuff first because it's going to be a disaster. Even if you do get a good job in the house and all that stuff, it's going to end up into a disaster. You need to put God first, plain and simple. You put God first before everything, you're going to have a great marriage. And it has to go both ways, by the way. Both the man and woman have to put God first for their marriage to go uh, accordingly, you know what I mean? And you put and have your faith in God. Don't be of little faith. Again, take therefore no door about tomorrow, for tomorrow shall bring its own worries and troubles. So sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So, the, you know, worry about today because... Uh, there's got to be some things, probably evil, whatever, all bad stuff going on. Worry about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Get through today, then worry about tomorrow when it becomes today, you know. So that's what it's saying. So, and always put God for us, you know. I mean, so that was a good chapter, guys. And I appreciate uh, you guys taking time, uh, almost an hour. I thought it was going to be an hour, too. Uh, but, yeah, it's so amazing, uh, the book of Matthew. And uh, sorry for botching up a couple of the verses. I like to stick to the King James. I know sometimes I even stumble reading it, but, you know what I mean? Uh, but it, it's an amazing book in uh, the King James Bible, or the Geneva, or whatever the case. And it, it's a great Bible, really is. It's going to take your time reading it, that's all.
You know what I mean? And sometimes I'm speeding up over here to read these things, and that's where I go from. I'm not the perfect person to read things out loud like that, but um, uh, yeah, I try whatever the case is. It's a, the message more than the uh, messenger, you know? So that's the message you're trying to get out. So guys, um, trust the plan, the only plan, and that's the Bible. No other doctrine, nothing. That's uh, sound doctrine only, guys. And don't take my word or somebody else's word for it. Read it for yourself. And remember, context is key. And let Scripture interpret Scripture. And if you like the show, guys, we've got a PayPal, Venmo, and Cash App. And uh, don't, I'm not trying to be like these uh, money-making ministries. You know, this, the, this here pays for the studio rent because we rent the studio and um, you in the office building and all that stuff. So uh, we rent our own studio and all that. So it pays for the rent. We have to pay for streaming services on Rumble because YouTube likes to shut us down a lot. And it pays for equipment. And right now I'm on my laptop. Um, we have like microphones and uh, you know top-notch equipment. We're trying to build up uh, to have a good quality show. So uh, for our special warfare Friday shows and our new shows we do as well. Uh, so we got PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, and it goes into the operation and the ministry you see here. Uh, the links are in the description, and we thank you so much for the people who have been donating, and thank you even more for praying for us. That's number one before anything, pray. Pray for us, for our safety, and uh, to protect us, and for this ministry to last, and we know the Father will provide either way, you know what I mean, for us, financially and spiritually, you know what I mean? So check out the awesome shows over at NYC TV, guys. Great shows, and we get the lineup right in the description, so subscribe to all the channels. And uh, check out nystv.org and get a free month on me. Dan the Man is the promo code to get 30 days free on me. No obligation. So check it out, guys. And, uh, again, if you go to my website, truthradioshow.com, uh, because we bounce from platform to platform. we got two or three YouTube channels. We have to do that because of YouTube. Uh, we got a Rumble channel as well. So what we do is we uh, instruct people, if you go to truthradioshow.com, uh, we always post our shows, you know what I mean, our uh, uh, Special Warfare Friday shows and our, um, our new show. So please go there. Truthradioshow.com will always have the link. You could actually watch it on the website or it'll take you to the platform. So please subscribe to our channels, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, amazing study, man. And, um, and here's the thing, too. I want to see what you could pull out of the Book of Matthew. So I'm sure people, when we were reading this today, you probably said, well, there's something else here, too. And if there is, I will please want you to put it in the comments because I've learned a lot of this, okay? Even though I read this a couple of times already, recently, this chapter 6, there's always something new, you know what I mean, that the Holy Spirit teaches. And I think the Holy Spirit teaches people accordingly uh, in, in certain, you know, with whatever the situation in your life is. So if you've seen the teaching out of this book of uh, Matthew chapter 6 here yeah, today that I didn't notice or when you watch the other chapters too, Please go into the, the in particular video and put it in the comment section and let me know what you think. Uh, so basically, uh, this is going to be premiering Tuesday. Uh, so this is not live, so it's going to be premiering. So if you got comments, yeah, you can put them in the, uh, the live chat. But also, please put them in the comment section because I w if they're in the live chat, I'm not, I won't be able to see them unless I'm watching the show with you guys. But um, please put it in um, the comment section. Uh, so and uh, let me know what you're... You know, if you got any questions, comments, concerns, and uh, if you think I said something wrong or, the, you know, came out, please tell me. I want to know. You know, don't be afraid because the Bible says to challenge every spirit. We can't be afraid to be wrong. We can't be afraid to admit that we are wrong. You know what I mean? And if I was wrong about something and you prove it to me, I will humbly admit that you are right. Well, the Bible's right, not you or me. The Bible's right and I was wrong and I, I'll correct myself. You know what I mean? So. And this is why it took me so long over the years to actually start doing biblical studies because I was just so afraid of misleading people. I don't want to be one of those uh, people that didn't answer the Lord for misleading uh, his uh, people. You know what I mean? So that's why I go over this very carefully and tread over this very carefully. And I suggest anybody to do the same if you're a um, person of God. So coming up on the hour, guys. So love you. God bless. Shalom. And you are the resistance. God bless. And shalom.